So no accordions. Is that what you said? No accordions? No accordion. What about bagpipes? You know, I, I thought about saying bagpipes, but we're yeah, going to keep... Okay. Bagpipes might be usable. Okay, okay, okay. <laughs> Amazing Grace sounds great on the bagpipes. Yeah, I'll, I'll see you there then. <laughs> I don't know how to do anything. <laughs> Go ahead and take your Bibles this morning. We're going to jump in the Word. We're in a series as a church. We're walking through, as you saw the little video, uh, relationship status. We're looking at different kinds of relationships. And how important, in January, we talked about our relationship with God and abiding in Christ and having intimacy with God. All the most important relationship you'll ever have is with God. And now we want to walk through some basic relationship things. We've been talking about the friends you, you need in your life and also the friends you need to avoid or the kind of friend you need to not be. And then last week, we talked about friendship being the foundation for all good, healthy, godly relationships. So the foundation of friendship. Today, I'm going to go a little different direction. Um, so we're talking about the gift of being single. All right, we'll throw the slide up there. So in case you're wondering what we're going, the gift of being single. All right. So today, I just want to give uh, the married men a little warning. There's sometimes you might feel like saying amen. It's probably not appropriate, just occasionally. You're just going to have to hold your tongue on that. Just don't get too excited about certain things I might say. Um, but I will say this before I begin. If you have him, you have everything you need. The ultimate relationship with God meets all of the needs in our life relationally. But how many people know God has also given us all kinds of opportunities to engage with people? People are a blessing. I, mean, I found it in life. People walk into your life. Sometimes they're a blessing. Sometimes they're a lesson, right? You just don't know always. But most of the time, God wants to bring people in your life to be a blessing. So I want to begin our time together, family, by communicating a conviction that I believe needs to be regularly repeated. And that is, besides making a, a decision to follow Jesus Christ, follow his leadership and his lordship, both areas, um, who you choose or who you do not choose to be in your life closely, to be romantically involved in specifically, actually makes some of the most consequential, that is going to be one of the most consequential decisions you'll ever make in this life. And if you don't believe me, if you're single, just ask a married person who's been married more than three months. I'm just telling you. Who you fall in love with, who you allow to come really close to your heart, and who you make a commitment to, the I do forever, um, makes a huge difference. Now, let me highlight and underscore the word consequential. When I say that, some of you are going, Okay, what does this all mean? Because I'm not saying your relational life is the most important thing in your life. It, it isn't. But relationships, how many people know, are vital if we're going to make it through this life at all, correct? How many had a mother that brought you into this world? How many are aliens from another planet that we should be concerned about? Okay. So what I'm saying is it affects everything all of your life. So today I'll be, I'll be addressing the blessing of the single life. Now, those of you who are married, hang tight. You're not excluded from this thought. I want to throw this on the screen. Decisions that are this consequential should not be made casually. And the church has not done a great job, a stellar job of communicating to the single people who are among us the value that they have, the importance that they are, that they are to others. And I'll tell you, this, the decision to remain single or to remain single again, or some of you have become single again, and uh, I got to tell you a story. There was these, I lived on a farm, you know that story, apples, potatoes, cabbage, and right beside us was a... Jersey cows, you know, the Jersey cows where you get Jersey milk, right? The chocolate. So we, there was some Jersey cow neighbors and uh, there were three spinster ladies, the chamber ladies, the chamber sisters, they're all there. And uh, they, were, uh, they were fascinating. Now, us brothers, we we're always like curious about these really old ladies who lived together in this big, we thought, haunted mansion that was the neighbor beside us. And we were always spying on them, looking at what, what do spinsters do? For the most part, they drank milk of magnesia. That's all we could figure it out. 
because there was in behind the house literally mountains of bottles. It was the weirdest experience. We'd be it's covered with vines. We'd be climbing. What are we climbing? And we'd dig under the vines, bottles and bottles, and I'm talking thousands of bottles of milk of magnesia. Now, that was my mind as a young boy. Single people got problems. <laughs> that, that's all we could think about. It's just weird, like these, wow. Anyways, they were the most lovely people. We had to help shovel their coal and do the kind of things that were old school and they couldn't get down the basement anymore. And so that was part of our job and we'd come out of there looking like soot. It was a, it was a fun experience. But anyways, the spinster ladies and uh, we loved them dearly. Let me tell you about the challenge in the world that we live in today for those who have believe God has called them to live a single life is that the spirit of the age fights with that idea. The spirit of this age, meaning where Paul uses, were to describe the certain social trends that happen in cultures, the way people typically do things at a given point in time in human history. And the spirit of the age has changed over time. Uh, the way people d typically do things and the spirit of the age has seemed to cultivate in this season right now, in the age that we live in, is a spirit of casualness when it comes to relationships. Ah, oh, well, yeah, all right. I'm in love, nah, I'm not. You know, everything, like people are not, commitment is not a word we find very often in the culture that we live in. Everything's pretty casual. You've heard the term casual sex before, right? It's, it's ca even added to that term. It really actually is completely not something that goes together. So. As I share this, as if those of you who choose um, to, to get married, God bless you. All right? You gave up. That's, there you go. It's okay. You got married. We're not looking down on you at all about it. But listen to me. Who you choose to give your heart to is a very big deal and cannot be treated casually. Would you agree with me this morning? Now watch this. Church culture is not the only culture that disciples. The world that we live in is continually discipling people in the spirit of the age to think a certain way, to believe a certain way, and many of that is contrary to what scripture, but the scripture uses the term to describe Christians who are discipled by the culture over the word, and the Bible calls Christians, they're, you're Christian, don't worry about your your. Your soul, you're, you're Christian, but you're carnal Christians, where the world's discipling has more strength than the scripture's discipling. So I want to combat that this morning, if you let me. You all right? Ready to, for me to step on some toes? If you yell ouch in the middle of the sermon, then I know I've made my point well. All right. All right. First Corinthians chapter 7, verses 7 to 9. I'm reading from the message translation because I love how we get trapped sometimes in our ideas of what that scripture is already going to say. And so I'm just going to read it from Eugene Peterson's point of view. By the way, if you don't have a message translation of the Bible, I encourage you to get one. There, it is amazing the freshness that it brings to your devotional life, all right? Sometimes I wish everyone was single like me. No, isn't that plain? You read the King James and you go, does he like being single? Or we have no idea what he's really saying there. Oh, thou be a singleist, whatever you say in the King James. But he says, sometimes I wish everyone were single like me. A simpler life in many ways. But celibacy is not for everyone any more than marriage is. That's clear. God gives the gift of the single life to some. Hence the title for today's message, The Gift of Being Single. God gives the gift of the single life to some, the gift of the married life to others. I do, though, tell the unmarried and widows that singleness might well be the best thing for them, as it has been for me. Now, how many people know that's contrary to what everybody thinks? And there's Paul making it really clear. So I want to set some expectations for today. Your feedback is always welcome. I'm anticipating feedback on this message. I can already tell by looking at your eyes that you've got some ideas that you want to con convey to me later. Send me an email. I love you. That's all good. But I, but I want to serve you well. As your pastor, there are some scriptures that I will not avoid because it's difficult. There are some things in the Bible that some pastors go, yeah, I don't think I won't touch that with a 10-foot pole. But I want to serve you well uh, and I have to hate to mention it, but sometimes I have to say things that you might not like or enjoy. 
I'm not here to please people. I want to please the Lord. I hope you're going to be gracious enough to let me do that as your pastor. And if you don't say amen there, then I'm getting nervous. (laughs) But I am pastoring everyone, not just you. Hear me out. I'm also pastoring a generation that is yet to enter these doors. So I'm preparing us as a church to be ready to pastor and lead and disciple a generation who is not yet here among us, of people that, are, that God loves dearly. I'm not call, I don't call the people that don't know Jesus lost. They just haven't, they're just not near Jesus yet. They're, they're pre-Christian. They're, they're pre-found people. God loves them dearly. How many people would believe that God so loved the world? Thank you for ringing that song that he gave Jesus. So, I'm pastoring all of us. No doubt we can all learn something, but I'm pastoring uh, today those who are single, particularly, but those of you who are married, you're not off the hook. Let me tell you a little story. Uh, In eighth grade, I'm going way back, uh, I was invited to a party. I don't know, that kind of seems young, but it was one of those school orchestrated parties where the teachers were chaperones. So not, not a bench of my, bunch of my buddies playing sports together and going off and building forts or b- blowing things up and all those kind of things we used to do as boys. Um, it was a kind of a, there's going to be girls there party. So we were supposed to like take a bath, shower, and get like smelling good. That was one of the prerequisites. And then we had to kind of arrive with some nice clothes on. And, and so how many people, this kid was really nervous. I have four brothers and dozens and dozens of boy cousins. My world was boys. Poor my mom. Can imagine that? She wouldn't even know how much breakfast to make in the morning. She would count the shoes at the door. Went to, okay, how many people? Okay, we got 16 boys here tonight. All right. She didn't even know she had to make breakfast for all us boys. It was a crazy time on the farm, but we loved it. But how many people know there were, I had no sisters and there were no girls in that equation? How many people, I'm a little, little, lacking some good knowledge, correct? Growing up without a sister, all the ladies, you're going, yes, poor idiot, brother, son there. <laughs> Anyways, I knew girls existed. I was nervous and I was nauseous at the same time. And then they played these crowd breaker games, icebreakers. Like, okay, it's not too bad. I can get through this. And, uh, and, I, and I, all the time, I'm sweating bullets. I'm just like really, really nervous. And then, and then some idiot. I, honestly, I use that word in the best of sense because I have other words I could have used instead of that. It is actually the nicest word I could have found. Uh, suggested that we have a dance. Honestly, I pray the most earnest prayer in that moment. God, get me the heck out of here was my initial, and I couldn't wait till my mom and dad came by in the driveway and picked us up and took us home. How many people know this boy's got problems? He had issues. That awkward grade eight moment was the, was the dawn of a new era for me that girls existed and we're supposed to in, engage with them. I, I wasn't necessarily a fan at that time, but it thrust me into the world, a complex world of men and women. How many people know I said last week, men are from Mars, women are from Venus. The book tries to explain things, but it's lousy at explaining it. How many guys, let's just give up. We'll never figure it out. It's just the way it's gonna be. But the reality is you are, you know, if you're single and ready to mingle, awesome. If you're single and like the last thing on your mind is remingling, God bless you. You're the wisest person in the house, I would imagine. So what about singleness? What is, what is Paul really trying to get at? And that's the question we're going to answer today with everything in our culture, everything in our world that tells us being in a relationship with someone is what will make us happy. Can I tell you that is a false idea? It really is. If what we're supposed to do, in the, in, if it's what, you know, like in the Jerry Maguire kind of movie world, where you complete me. How many people gag? Like, you know, you watch these things. How many people, those Hallmark movies, ladies, what are you doing to yourself? I am not so, Harlequin books, in the name of Jesus, come out. Oh my goodness. Filled with all these lies. You guys. I know the whole bookstore is filled with Christian novels that are romance, and I guess I haven't read them, but I guess they're okay. I'm not sure. They're okay? Yeah. Okay. But 
awesome. So whatever, you know, what every romantic comedy and every Disney movie princess story, uh, every happy ending has a boy and a girl running off the sunset. It's like, oh, I'm not so sure. Um, we like pretending. Here's my first point. Number one, is Jesus Lord of all of your time? If you want God to be Lord of your relationships, there are a few steps you need to take. First of all, as we looked last week, if you want a healthy relationship, you have to develop close friendships. Everyone is called to have close friendships in your life. You need to start using your time in view of God's plan for your life and in view of the light of eternity. We don't just make decisions based on what's happening on the planet. We base decisions as followers of Jesus on what the will and purposes of God are. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Amen. Colossians chapter 4 verse 5 says, use your time in the best way you can. Isn't that good advice? So time is your most precious resource. Your single years, single people, your single years are the most precious time of your life. They really are. Time is more important than money. You can always get more money, but you can't always get more time. In this life, you'll have a certain amount of time allotted to you. You can't make time. You can't borrow time as much as you'd like to. You can't save time. You, you can't extend time. Some of you are thinking this message, thank God, it's not going to be extended beyond a certain amount of time. You're already like counting the minutes till Swiss Chalet or wherever you're going. Time is what life is all about. You can only use time. We all the same amount of time every week. How many hours do we have in a week? And we good at math? 168 hours. That's all you'll ever get. The Beatles lied. Eight days a week is not true. We have 168 hours. What are we doing with those hours? If you learn to manage your time well, uh, if you can't, you can't manage life, basically, because life gets dulled out in pieces of time because your time is your life. Now, how you use your singlehood is one of the ways that God tests you about this precious season of your life. It prepares you, in a sense, for eternity. We're, we're, see, he's watching all of us, even in this moment right now, married, single, or elsewise, if there's something in between. Uh, he's watching to see how you manage the gift of the time you have, and as you're a single person, he's, managing, he's watching how you manage your single years. You ever heard of YOLO? You only live once? Y-O-L-O, not LOL, which people are putting. I don't really think all of you are ending your emails with LOL. You're really laughing out loud, literally laughing out loud. LOL. That was a snicker, maybe. Some of you guys got to just like, ooh, calm it down. Unless you're like always, woo ah, 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 about everything. But you're ending your emails with LOL all the time. And your text, LOL. On Facebook, come on, you guys. I see you, LOL. Mm -hmm. Maybe just a little half smile smirk. That maybe some of that's not even funny at all. Let's just be honest. All right. But anyways, you only live once. But if you live it right, once is enough. And so you've been given the number of years, six score and ten more, or whatever that is. Six score and ten more. That means you're you're what 120? No, that's wrong. Three score and ten more. Is that right? Eight more? I, I have no idea. We all have a designated amount of time and God knows. So we live it to the fullest. Because if you live your life right, it's enough. One of Satan's strategies is to get you so busy doing unimportant things. Things that you don't have time for. Things that push out the important things. Life's most important things. Satan knows that he doesn't have to get you to sin. He just, he doesn't even, he doesn't have to get you to get to be bad, he just has to get you to be busy. Some of us are so busy with stuff that means nothing at the end of it. If you have a hobby, that's fine. You need to like, you know, brain drain and just do something non, you know, whatever you're carving or you're, you know, f tying fish flies or whatever you do for your hobby. That, that's not, I'm not talking about wasting your time, but how much time, one thing social media is gonna prove that we had enough time to pray. 
You know how many times people look at their phones in a given day? I'd hate to say it. Apparently it's every eight seconds or something like that. It's really ridiculous. I don't know if it's that bad, but people are looking at that hundreds of times. Why? Hear a little notification. People are addicted to notifications. I changed my notifications just to freak me out, the sound. It was and I think, oh my gosh, what's going on here? It's not like ding dong. And uh, oh, somebody wants to text me. So when I scare myself, I don't know if this is you, if you, you're in the habit of looking at your phone every time somebody gets a notification, just change it to a weird and you don't want to look at that thing. There's a weird siren on there that makes you not, oh, I don't want anything to do with that phone. Anyway, some of you are addicted to your phones and I'm pointing some fingers at myself too. The reality is we have time for a lot of things. Jesus said this, sorry, uh, Acts, not Jesus, but in, in Acts chapter 20, verse 24, it says, my life is worth nothing to me unless I use it for finishing the work assigned me by the Lord Jesus. God wants to use your life, every section, segment and time era of your life. We can only do it when you're investing your time in the most important things. He really wants to use your life for his glory, for your good. So we need to view our time in the light of eternity. So you have to ask yourself this question. And I'll ask this, out. how much of what I'm spending my time on is going to count five to 10 years from now? The most important things. How much is going to count for eternity? If not, then you have to refocus. You have to kind of look at your priorities of your time. So use your time in, in view of eternity so that God can help you and remain focused. So as a single person, uh, what are the purposes? So apparently you go to school, you find a job, you buy a car, you, you get a dog, uh, you save money for a rainy day, you get married, you, have, like you just kind of think that there's, oh, this is just the way life is supposed to be. But is that the way it's supposed to work? People get married and think, oh, I finally found the yin to my yang, the jelly to my peanut butter. I mean, I've got everything. Life is not toast. And just because you feel like you're peanut butter doesn't mean you need more jelly to make your life complete. In fact, you are complete in him. Best advice I can give marriage counsel, in marriage counseling is God doesn't want, to give, want you to give 50-50 to make it work. If you only give 50-50 in your relationship, that marriage is going to fail. You give 100 100, 110 and 110% to each other. If you're only giving part of yourself or half of your energy and your time to the, to the other, then you're actually setting yourself up in your marriage for failure. God wants you to... You, now, watch this interesting here. Uh, I'm going to read this scripture. In 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 1. So un unpacking the principle of being single... Um, it'll revolutionize the way you think and when you look at scripture. Even if you're married, no free passes today. Watch this, 1 Corinthians 7, 1. Now for the matters you wrote about, now I'm, I'm helping you understand it. Let me answer the questions, Paul's saying, let me answer the questions you sent me regarding men and women, how they relate and how marriage should work for that matters, for the matters you wrote about. This is what he says. It is good for a man not to marry. Remember I said earlier, men don't say amen, right? That's one of the things. It's good for a man not to marry. Wait a second. I think we're misunderstanding Paul. I think Paul misunderstood the question. Paul's like, I know that all I tell you about marriage and all how beautiful it is, I want you to know that not getting married is actually a really good choice. Let me explain. When the Apostle Paul uses this word good, he says, he says it is good for a man not to marry. Let me, let me give you the original Greek language. Open up concordance and look at the word Greek language here. Are you ready for this? The word good in the original means good. <laughs> He's saying that it's good for a person to got married. How many of you were married and thinking, how come nobody preached this before? What do you mean? It's good not to be married. If you got two choices, number one is marriage and the number two choice is not being married, he says, choose door number two. Paul's very confusing here. How many of you are married and you don't want to admit, like, ah, uh, I'm not sure what's going on. Verse two, seven, verse two, but since there is so much immorality, each man should have his own wife and each woman have her own husband. Oh, okay, Whew. So Paul, it's a good idea then because the world we live in and because of stress and 
temptation and immorality and everything else. In other words, it's really good for you not for you to not get married, but because of the sexual immorality in the world, okay, uh, marriage is a fine choice. Feels like it's like we didn't win when we got married. Oh well, it's a concession. I can't make it in this world without a. I'll be honest with you. How many people know the days that I dress myself and the days my wife dresses me? How many people notice the difference? <laughs> exactly. How many guys in the house can really admit you'd be a, a, a loser in life if you didn't marry your wife? You're gonna just, guys, just come on. How many people know we need, we need them more than they ever need us? Guys, are you gonna admit that? Come on, guys, I'm helping you here. How, you, we just, we, yes. We, I don't know, we, it's not good for man to be alone. Notice in the Bible, it's not good for a woman to be alone. I mean, God is pretty clear. And guys, we just, all right, yes, we need you. We really, we really do. Uh, so, <laughs> verse six of the same chapter, he goes on. So we're just unpacking chapter seven. I say this as a concession, not as a command. I'd really rather you avoid marriage, but understanding culture, understand the immorality of the world you're living in, it's a concession. Yeah, the message translation really knows how to bring it clear. Let me be clear. He's not saying stay single, move in together, have sex, and avoid marriage. That is not what he's saying. So all the single people are going, huh? No, 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 no. That's not what he's saying. Does anybody find this surprising when you start to dig down into what Paul's trying to say here? Uh, why would he say this? Why would God put such an emph emphasis on staying single? Because singleness is a gift. It seems counterintuitive, very counterculture. But the answer is right there. The answer is right in all of our own hearts. Our hearts are idol factories. We, we mass produce idols. We worship things that are completely outside of God's will and purposes for our lives. The heart is basically a little idol factory. And the internal idol worship that we have, we put certain things on pedestals and we worship it. Like, we got to get married. We, 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 and I know a girl, I won't mention her name. We had a song and everything. When I worked at Circle Square Ranch, it goes, oh, here she comes. Watch it, boys, she'll marry you. Oh, here she comes. It's, and, then, and then we put her name in there. It's da, da, da. You know that song, Maneater? You ever heard that song? Whoa, here she comes, yeah. So we used to sing that song, because this girl, she had a hope chest, a treasure chest of things that she did, and she was single, and she brought it to Circle Square Ranch in case she found her man at the ranch. She brought her whole hope chest in her room. It took up like a quarter of the room with all the stuff she did, which you get married, a bridal gown, everything, and we go, run! It's just a crazy idea because she idolized getting married as the ultimate goal of life. It was quite sad. Ezekiel 14.3 says, 14, says, God says about the elders of Israel, these men have set their idols, where? In their hearts. So it's not that they're bowing down to some wooden statues. They're not, you know, this wasn't what's happening here in Ezekiel. And it's not like we're doing that. Oh yeah, we idolize marriage. We idolize these things. And we really want that success and all that stuff. But we don't, we don't bow down, but... Our hearts do. So what was God saying about the human heart? The human heart takes good things, like success, like a career, like marriage, material possessions, family. Come on, some of you can idolize family above God even. Just be very careful. Into the ultimate of things of life. Seeing an idol is anything more to you than God and anything that absorbs your heart and your passions, your commitments, your time, your imagination more than God. So it could be your beauty. It can be your brains. It could be your bravery or even catch this young people. You need to catch this. It could even be your bay. Anybody over 30 goes, what? That's a romantic relationship. That's our story. That is mankind's story. We always put dumb things on pedestals and think that's the most important thing we need to pursue. Now, this is all taken from Corinthians, and I'm going to get Idle, uh, Kyle to come up here in a second. He's going to help me finish this message because I'm, 
I'm married, he's not. So he's got, the only way for this message to work is for a single guy to finish my message. But I gotta tell you about Corinth a little bit. The city of Corinth, where all this comes from, Paul's very, being very specific to them. It's where these people live. It was a city that was built on indulgence, excess. The nickname for Corinth was like Vegas, Sin City. In fact, there was a term that people would take trips to Corinth and they would be headed there and they'd say, oh, you want to get Corinthianized. In other words, they'd go out there and just sin without control, cut loose. And, and truly, what happens in Corinth stays in Corinth, apparently. But this is the, the word that's being addressed and relationships were idolized in Corinth. They worshiped all kinds of pagan gods that represented all kinds of, there were idols that represented all kinds of relationships. Fertility, gods, and you name it, all the way down the line. Point number two, being single is a calling. Hello, oh, there it is. Had to work this in before May, so it would uh, make some sense. <laughs> oh. Yeah, being single is a calling. Is that surprising to some of you? It is, as much as anything. It requires the, the supernatural hand of the Lord to speak to your heart, to know that that is what the Lord would have for you. It's not something that we enter into lightly or frivolously or, or to think that it's some kind of uh, thing that we are left to when options are not there. You know, Jesus was um, in the middle of a conversation on divorce at the time, but he says this, which I think is very interesting. Um, in Matthew 19, uh, verse 12, he says, for there, are, for there are eunuchs who were born that way. There are eunuchs from whom have been made eunuchs by others. And there are those who choose to live as eunuchs for the sake of the kingdom of heaven. Those who can accept this should accept it. In other words, you know, whenever you see Jesus end something like that, we know that he's not talking about something that is easy and natural and something we can just frivolously choose to do. As important as marriage is, singleness is just as much of a calling. And, um, you know, singleness can sometimes seem to be some kind of predetermined decision or a time-sensitive one. You know, I'm like, I'm this old. It's like, I guess I, guess I had my shot. <laughs> you know, while speaking on divorce, Jesus makes this comment on singleness that it's not for everyone, but must be weighed carefully. He uses the example of eunuchs to say that some choose to deny themselves marriage for the sake of the kingdom. And so the question to keep in your minds, do you see singleness as a calling from the Lord? You know, what does the Lord have to say? And then the uh, second thing I want to mention to you, it comes from Philippians 2, verse 2, um, from the Apostle Paul. It says, Then make my joy complete by being like-minded, having the same love, being one in spirit and one in mind. You know, the greatest goal for every single one of us in this room, as Pastor Anthony had shared, is to put our focus firmly on the Lord. Everything else that comes into your life, every friendship, every relationship, everything that comes into your path must be weighed against that calling. And if it doesn't line up, it's got to be thrown out. God is first. And God is enough. He makes you complete. The day you gave your heart to the Lord and chose to follow him, you're as complete as you ever needed to be. And I just want to... Uh, I just really want to impress that upon that. Making the point, ask questions of the Lord. What is my calling? What is the path? Because sometimes that can be a big disillusionment to us when we, we don't know where we're going and so the things that come into our lives, it's hard for us to know what am I supposed to be doing with this? What is for me? So seek the Lord on this and know what your calling is and you will find joy complete in just having the Lord. And just the third thing I wanted to say as well, also from the Apostle Paul, 1 Corinthians 7, verse 35, he says, I am saying this, and I catch this, for your own good, not to restrict you. So if you're married, you're not doing anything wrong. <laughs> yeah. 
the Lord is with you in that, but that you may live in a right way in undivided devotion to the Lord. Powerful. Today I want to dispel the lies of the enemy that singleness makes you less. Let me just say that again. I want to dispel the lie of the enemy that says to you that singleness makes you less, less useful to the Lord, less a child of his, or anything along those lines. You are never less. When you have the Lord, you have all that you need. Um, in our scripture, Paul addresses the advice not as a restraint, but rather to a benefit to us. If you are wondering about singleness, you know, does it, and this is the questions to ask yourself, does it promote in me what is right? Does it keep me on an undistracted path towards the Lord? You know, Pastor Anthony commented, you know, there is, there's lots of immorality in this world. There's lots of temptation. Even the Apostle Paul does comment on that in a way, like that if we are in a position where um, we're finding that kind of temptation, it is a good thing for us to consider marriage. So the Apostle Paul, it does kind of touch on that as well. Um, but the most important thing is whatever I am doing, am I undistracted? And am I completely devoted to the Lord? And if you can answer that question as yes, hey, you're on the right path with the Lord, and the Lord is going to bless you. He's going to guide you. He's going to lead you into everything that he desires to do. And you will be amazing. So I just would encourage you to meditate on these things and to know the hand of the Lord is on you, whether you are single, whether you are looking to be married, or whatever position you, or stage you are in life, the Lord is with you. And uh, you don't need anything else added to you except the Lord's presence and his power. And you will do amazing, amazing things. So I just want to bless you with that this morning and to know the Lord is with you. All right, I'm going to close with these thoughts. Thank you, Kyle. Appreciate that. This is going to be a strange point. You're going to do a little bit of a double take. Not that might surprise you that that'll bring up something strange. But the, the point number three, I'll just put it right out there. Singles are a gift from God. To us, to me, to the church. Those who are single, not married, um, you are a gift to this body. You have an opportunity and a capacity to love people uniquely in a way that God has called you to love people. I don't know if you've been watching Asbury Revival. I'm gonna actually throw to those slides now, Andy. But in Asbury, there are, uh, the second slide I think it is. We, so I pulled, so I had a, somebody that lives down there in, in, in Wilmore, Kentucky, um, took some photos on the last weekend. So they're, they're trying to wind, they can't just be 16 days later and they're still worshiping nonstop. It's, it's an un unbelievable thing. Thousands of people coming to Christ. You'll see some interesting photos there. There's a photo on the bottom left of 19, uh, sorry, not 19 guys, a 19 hour van ride to get to Asbury and they arrived after it already closed but they let them in. These are guys who are in a halfway house who wanted to experience the presence of Jesus. So the halfway house driver just drove 19 hours, got there, and it was over. And yet they came to the altar in repentance and tears in the presence of the Lord. All these single guys here who've been incarcerated for years are finding this incredible touch from the Holy Spirit in their lives. Church, there are more single people in this world than there are married people. There are more people who are single who are desperate for community, needing a touch from God and to be loved and cared for. Church, the harvest is single. There'd be some married people thrown in the mix of it. But if 65% of our population is single, how many people know just by percentages alone, there's gonna be a lot of single people coming in the last day's harvest. Are we ready as a church or do we feel like a country club where it's for 
just a certain bunch of people that fit together because of our social economic backgrounds and will people from diverse backgrounds and diverse experiences be welcome in this house. That center photo at Asbury is a photo of, I think it's two or three hours of just pure silence before the Lord. Individuals just seeking God. That line up there of cars, apparently it was like at one point 14 hours to get into the revival, sitting in a car. Chick-fil-A drove by every vehicle and gave food. Gotta love Chick-fil-A. Free food, free everything, people are giving money, the people of Wilmore, just hospitality was the marker of this revival. Extreme hospitality. Can I tell you folks, the, the future of evangelism is hospitality. Sitting at a table, having a coffee, sharing a meal, Oh, by the way, the center is volunteer police and fire and rescue organizing and coordinating. They had the military there to coordinate the lines. It's just unbelievable. Thousands and thousands and thousands of people in a town of 6,000 trying to get to a place where God was at work. Could we pray that God would bring us a harvest? That God would touch us, that we would be open for his spirit to move? You have to understand, when Paul's talking here, he's breaking new ground with these statements, countering the culture of the time. So the Jewish people had the idea that for them even, to be fruitful and multiply was the ultimate goal. The idea was that a good Hebrew was to get married and to have kids and extend the legacy. A singleness was a taboo. Every time they called their, you know, how many people, I don't know if you have an aunt or, or, or you were single and you're, you're talking to your mom on the phone. And, and they would say something like, oh, I met this attractive young man. I think he's an accountant. You should call him. All well-meaning moms and aunts trying to get the young lady married. Um, you've heard the term. It used to be open, I mean, uh, Ontario Bible College. It was called Ontario Bridal College. Because obviously the ultimate goal is not to learn about God, but to get married. Even in the church culture, we have these really strange cultures that aren't great. So singleness isn't a curse. In fact, single people, we need you. You are a gift to us. We need your relationship with God. We need you as part of this church. And the future of this church is going to be a lot of single people. So I'm going to end it up. We're all over 1 Corinthians. But let me, let me just throw this last scripture here in 1 Corinthians 7, verse 28. Because singleness is a gift. Singleness is special. If you're single and you, don't, you feel the pressure to get married and you're not supposed to, don't, don't give up on your pursuit of God. You're not in a holding pattern. By the ways, don't settle for like, Okay, he's, he's breathing, he's got legs, he's, he's a man. I think I'll marry him. Uh, hold off. Find the right guy. Guys, find, don't just find Miss Wright, you know, like that's the whole goal. I've got to find Miss Wright because literally, as you know, you marry Miss Wright and then she becomes Mrs. Always Wright, so you have to be careful. <laughs> just kind of, oops. Sonia said, don't tell that joke. It was a joke. That was supposed to be humor. If you're offended at me, I don't need an email on that one. Watch what Paul says. But if you do marry, you have not sinned. And if a virgin marries, she has not sinned. But those who marry will face many troubles in this life. And I want you, and I want to spare you this. So I'm, I'm asking the single people in this house, can you help us married people? We got problems. We got troubles. We had no idea. And we need you as encouragement and a blessing to our lives. We're not looking at all a single person like they don't have it together or just because they're not married. He might have had it more together than the rest of us. And we need you. And we love you. And we're glad you're here. And as a pastor, I am thrilled 
that we're going to be a family, a real family that cares about every generation and every status of life. Who's with me on that prayer? Father, today we thank you for your word. Thank you that Corinthians is so clear how beautiful the gift of singleness is. For every person who is single or single again, Lord, I just thank you. Father, they're not just in a temporary state. They're in the middle of your will. In fact, Lord, marriage is temporary. We were born single. We will leave single. Will it be in heaven single? Lord, marriage is just temporary. So Lord, if anything, help us change that thinking. Thank you for the gift. Being able to focus on you primarily. And we thank you, Lord, that this church is a place that is prepared to reach hearts and minds of people who are married and not married, single, young, old, all in between. We put no limits on the kind of harvest you want to bring our congregation to disciple. In Jesus' name we pray.